John Dean on the line with us, the former, uh, for 1,000 days, the lawyer for Richard Nixon in the White House, the author of several books, including Worse Than Watergate, The Secret Presidency of George W. Bush, and con- my favorite, Conservatives Without Conscience. And he is uh, author, lecturer, TV commentator, former Nixon White House counsel. His uh, Twitter is at John W. Dean, and his website, verdict.justia.com slash author slash dean. We'll put a link to that over at tomhartman.com if you didn't write it down all that fast. And, John Dean, welcome back to the program. Thanks, Tom. Great to have you. You, you wrote a piece uh, titled, uh, John Dean, dean Knows How to Get Rid of Clarence Thomas. Uh, I don't know if you wrote that title or somebody I else. I did not. I okay. typically not use my name in my title. Okay, I, I figured as much. But that, that I've, I've seen it in several different places in the Internet with that title. But, um, but it does say, by John Dean. You did write this, right? I did write the piece, yeah. Okay, great. Um, three pieces that I'd like to go through with you in the, the six or so minutes that we've got here. Um, one, why we have to be concerned about Clarence Thomas. Number two, the story of Abe Fortas and what happened in Nixon's White House when you were there, when you were the Associate Deputy Attorney General. And number three, uh, whether or not Mr. Uh, Obama and uh, Holder would consider doing what John Mitchell and Richard Nixon did. Um, so you want to just go through these? Sure, absolutely. Let's start out with Clarence Thomas. What is the problem? Well, I, we have a problem of a justice who is persistently reported to have a conflict of interest. Every time it's raised, he refuses to address it, uh, and the next report seems to be a little bit more egregious. What prompted the piece I wrote is the New York Times released another story indicating uh, that his friend, Mr. Crow, who is a uh, very wealthy conservative contributor to almost all conservative causes, uh, that catch his fancy anyway, uh, has put up mil- literally millions of dollars to fund a project that Clarence Thomas has a personal interest in in his hometown in Pinpoint, Georgia, a, an old cannery uh, <laughs> that they've, they've uh, preserved and protected for future generations. I'm sure it's, it's important to the history of the area, but mm-hmm. the fact that you have a justice with a very special and peculiar interest in it uh, creates the conflict. So uh, this is just a persistent problem, and uh, it, 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 to me, is in some regards more egregious than what happened with a bit of history we're going to talk about in a minute, which is Abe Fortas. Right. So, so I thought it deserved attention. Yeah, and, and not to mention in all the money that his wife has gotten from all these conservative causes, uh, uh, in, uh, which some people say, well, you can separate that out. That's his spouse. She should have an independent life. But as you point out, there are direct conflicts just with Mr. Crow. That's, he's of the uh, Trammell Crow uh, industry company, Fortune? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. On, the, on the wife, Tom, you know, I, I, we all agree that a wife is a separate entity and, and, and can do her thing. But when you're, when you're lobbying for the Tea Party and they have the same interest before the court, when she's lobbying to get held on constitutional health care, uh, it does create, create the appearance of a conflict. Now, in all of the rules of ethics that apply to the rest of the federal judiciary below the Supreme Court, even an appearance of a conflict is justification for recusal. Right. Uh, but in this instance, Mr. Thomas won't even address whether he has a problem. Right. And, uh, or his wife. So we've been here before. In, in, uh, back in, when you were the Associate Deputy Attorney General in Richard Nixon's White House, uh, in, in the Department of Justice, in fact, um, you, you say you were there when Assistant Attorney General William Rehnquist, who later became Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, outlined how to remove a Supreme Court justice. Tell us about this. Well, it, it had never been done at that time, uh, and there wasn't a very strong case against Fortas, but Rehnquist prepared this memo based on a worst-case scenario. Uh, in other words, that the fact that uh, Fortas's wife was receiving a grant from a foundation uh, from a former client of Abe Fortas's before he went on the court, the fact this client was later indicted and, and found guilty of securities violations. Uh, and, and there were just all kinds of extenuating circumstances. So Rehnquist took this, everything to be the worst case. In other words, that the, 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 the justice was on the take, that he was being bribed, what have you. He used that for a basis to proceed against him. Uh, in a hypothetical situation where Mitchell, the attorney general, then took that memorandum uh, based on some historical precedents, uh, went to the chief justice and said, listen, 
Uh, we think there's smoke here. Uh, we're going to go out and find out if there's fire. We are going to start a, cr- a grand jury investigation unless Fortas resigns from the court. It was a real hardball move. Now, now uh, Fortas was a, a very liberal justice. Is that why Nixon wanted to get rid of him? Absolutely, absolutely. So this was, was this was a political ideological. takedown. It was a political takedown, and Amazing. it was it was it was it was a bluff in 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 many ways. Of course, an attorney general uh, who is determined to open a grand jury uh, has a little different card to play in a bluff than most people. Yep. Uh, so uh, that was a factor in all this. And when when Fortas, who's a very able legal mind in his own, uh, smelled a bluff. Uh, and, and resisted uh, Mitchell up the stakes and said, listen, we're going after your wife, uh, who was a very prominent tax specialist in Washington, opening an old grand jury proceeding against her and one of your former partners uh, at, uh, at your old law firm, wow. if, you, if, if you don't see this the way we do. So Fortas, rather than wanting to embarrass the court, embarrass his wife, embarrass his partner or himself, just walked away from the court. Amazing. So he resigned, which is the outcome that we would like for, for uh, f- in this case, uh, Clarence Thomas. Uh, Scalia, for example, after Bush v. Gore, his son got a real cushy job in the, in the Bush administration. I mean, there, and not to mention his, uh, you know, hanging out with Dick Cheney and shooting his friend in the face um, just before he ruled on a case that involved Dick Cheney. I mean, there, we could even make the case against Scalia, couldn't we? Have well, you can. And one of the problems, Tom, is, is justices, like a lot of high-level officials, are very underpaid in, in, in yeah. comparison to the rest of the system and the rest of the economy. Yeah. In other words, their law clerks will go out within a, a year or two and be making maybe as much as ten times what the judge makes. Yeah, John uh, Roberts it, it, is a case in point. Uh, he had been a clerk to Rehnquist. He left that job and had a $2 million a year job, uh, if the reports were right in the, in the newspapers, as a, uh, uh, as a corporate attorney representing corporations at the time that uh, George W. Bush brought him back onto the court where his pay dropped back down to whatever they make. What is it, 180000 a year or something like right. that, 200000 a year? He had, he had accumulated enough that he had a cushion. But most of right. these guys were, had been on the court any length of time at all. And this really is true across the federal judiciary. It's true in the states as well. We've got a problem in New York State with people resigning like mad who are good judges who can't afford because they can't put their kids through school right. and so on and so forth. We've got to sort this problem out. We're yeah. either going to have a second-rate judiciary uh, across the board and it's going to pull down our Well, we, our already, whole system we already do to some extent. And, the, and then, then you got the Federalist Society and the other right-wingers coming in saying, oh, well, we'll help you out with speaking fees and things like this. But, but we have less than a minute left. John, we're talking with John Dean. So there is a precedent. Richard Nixon took out a Supreme Court justice because he thought the guy was too liberal, a political takedown. Is it conceivable that President Obama and Eric Holder could do the exact same thing to Clarence Thomas, threaten him with a grand jury? There's no question they could do it. The question is, do they have the will to do it? As I read it, Tom, they don't. This isn't the kind of game the, that Democrats play. There's a very different philosophy between the two parties in the value of these federal judicial seats uh, from the highest court right on through the system. Uh, it, it's a blood sport for Republicans, and as I describe it in the article, it's beanbag for, for Democrats. They'll throw things that might sting, but they don't, uh, they don't get too uh, hurtful of anybody. Uh, they're not ruthless, so uh, the, the Thomas is safe. It's not going to happen. Wow. That, that is uh, the most depressing thing I've heard all day, <laughs> I've got to say. But, well, you know, maybe, maybe we could uh, put some pressure on the president or something, you know, petitions and things. That's in- the reason I raised the whole matter in the column, Tom. Great, great. So hope springs eternal. All right. <laughs> John Dean, always great talking with you, sir. Likewise. Thank you for dropping by. And uh, one of these days, we got to talk about Marbury versus Madison. <laughs> we'll be back.